Yohanna, Yohanna Tichi, Yohanna, Yohanna Tichi, Yohanna, Yohanna Tichi, Yohanna, Yohanna Tichi. Asi piniki mana, yonini hiniki mana, Yohanna, Yohanna Tichi. The arid western United States. There are ancient nations spread across the land. They go by Indian names, Paiute, Shoshone. It is Indian country. Few Americans know these lands and their peoples and the Indian nations are losing in power and influence. Right in the midst of Indian country are military installations, water extraction projects. Modern technology has come to the ancient desert. The animals, the people, the ancient petroglyphs have new neighbours. What was once a quiet land is now the site of battle. But those who trace their ancestry still hold great affection for this land. It's not a real plush place, but it's a beautiful country in its own right. I think our, just our ancestors, it was an easy life. This was their home and they made do with what they could gather for his food and stuff to get along. There's a belief and I guess a faith that if there's a great cause, we definitely will come together because we're a very strong people. Um, we carry ourselves very prideful. What's fascinating is, you know, Indians get discouraged, but we have a resilient factor to us to where we continue to find another way. The Paiute, the Shoshone, are grappling with ways to preserve the beauty and resources of the land. But distant powers insist on using the earth for their own uses. Los Angeles, for example, desires water and power from Indian lands. It is from Indian land that mountains capture and hold water. It looks dry, but water is in its depths. For generations, the Indians have fought for their land, but discouragement set in. The Indians always never had a, a power, never had a strength to fight back whatever is taken from us. We've always seen like given up. There are so many trespassing signs that we see that we, uh, we're afraid to go into a lot of places. And uh, that isn't fair to us Indian people because this is our country. Before we didn't speak up, we didn't have a chance to speak up because we were always cut down. And uh, so it was just a waste, a waste of time, you know, years ago to say anything. The Indians always never had a, a power, never had a strength to fight back whatever is taken from us. We've always seen like given up, you know. They were locked out here from the road to their ancient springs, Koso Hot Springs. 
people kind of did feel that they, they did not have any power and they were left, their, uh, their destiny was left in the hands of, of others. But I can understand that from those earlier generations, the problems that they faced were pretty insurmountable. <laughs> they lost their identity over a period of time. But I think once you start to recognize yourself and understand your, your cultural identity, you become stronger. And that, that strength then um, allows you to not only understand your, your own culture and your people and your history, but it gives you that sense of empowerment that now I know exactly who I am. Despite a sense of loss, the elders, the older generation, held on to their beliefs and their language. Other generations before us, like my grandfather's generation, he was, he was told to be ashamed of his culture. He was told to be ashamed of the, the language that he spoke. And so as a result, as he grew older, he didn't use the language. You know, he, he didn't talk about the ways of the past because, because it made him feel bad. And that was brought on by, by others coming in saying that they had no use for, for our people. Our people have been resilient over thousands of years in this place because we recognized where we lived and we lived locally. People need to recognize who we are as a people and celebrate our culture. When the Equal Rights Movement spread across America, Indians felt a new wave of hope. It was a part of that 1950s, 60s civil rights movement that I think people began to realize that they did have power. For myself, thinking back on one of the classes that really kind of opened my eyes was a, was a class on, on African-American literature. And that was really the first time that I, I, I read books by African-American authors and the plight of African-Americans. And, and I remember thinking, you know, a lot of what they're encountering, what they've had to go through, isn't different than, than what I was facing or, or my ancestors faced. I feel pretty confident that those things will not be lost. You know, there is this, this kind of a, kind of a renaissance, I guess, this rebirth in, in knowing uh, language and knowing culture. The songs, the language, th those are important parts of, of our identity. And, and if we were to lose those aspects, we would lose a huge part of who we are. <laughs> Today, Indian country is seeing a rebirth of the old ways, weaving, language, songs, arts and crafts. But I do believe that our people were very creative. They were creative people. That has, really hasn't changed because, because you can see the art in different forms, whether it be in, in uh, paintings or in beadwork, um, in songs. I just call it a starburst. A lot of them are just starbursts if I'm using those, those colors. In the beginning when I first started, it was a couple of days, get it out. But you're sitting there for 12, 15 hours. Rosella's art is not necessarily traditional, but she does find her roots in the old ways. Women have a lot of hair, so what they do is they put it in and they just stick this through it like this, and it holds their hair in the back, so it's back in here. Instead of the clip, it's held by this.
sometimes I get into a thing where I'm just doing nothing but either the teal or the or blues or the you know the fall colors I just start making those certain types and I'll do everything in that for a while and then I'll change to something else this could be a clip it could be just about anything you know whatever you want it to be and you can make it a little larger make it a buckle and so it's I see it as a continuation of, you know, like our songs and stuff is if you keep it going, it's going to be there because everybody's going to have a different design, different ideas of what they, of how they want to do it. And like our songs, they're there. They've been changed over the years. I said different people hear them differently. They sing the same song, but it's always heard sung differently. The songs, the language, those are important parts of, of our identity and and if we were to lose those aspects we would lose a huge part of who we are the songs were about the character in the story like two kinney two kinney's a small hawk so when he went on his journey he would sing his song and then his relatives or people that knew him his, his song would go to Kenny neighbor, Paza one na Paza one na over and over. To Kenny knew I am To Kenny. That's my name. He's singing. Hip the hey on the hip the hey on the ho 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 ho. Parts of Indian country stretch for hundreds of miles. Here is Mono Lake, an ancient inland sea. I just want to ask the spirits of the land here, spirits of the lake, spirits in the mountains, permission to be out here on the lake today and ask that we come out here in a good way. And I'm going to do a blessing song for the lake. This is coiling. And uh, this is with the uh, sedge roots and the deer grass. We can look back at the baskets. We know that's how they were put together. But, you know, what is really traditional and what's, what was just a person's tradition, you know, like individual people, you know, because sometimes I'll put a different stitch in here. So I say it's like a Lucy Parker stitch <laughs> and somebody else who was making, you know, another basket maker would say, well, that's my stitch or whatever. But you try to keep in within the, the techniques. I go to areas where I've been gathering for a pretty long time. And, um, you know, nowadays it's a little bit challenging because you have the Forest Service lands or the BLM lands, National Park, and you're not supposed to be gathering anything or taking anything from the parks so um but with permission you know we can we can still go in and do a lot of our gathering i'm really like it here a lot it's like all these things were here 20 years ago and 20 years ago and the other 20 years ago so there's a lot of witnesses out here as you know, we people have kind of come and g gone, and uh, we were here, and now we're back here again. For Lucy Parker, the spirits of the ancients still preside over Mono Lake. It's like you work on it whenever you have time and then you have to do the collecting time, which is another big, you know, every year collecting. Like right now I'm going, you know, I want to go get willow and then I have to sit and split it. You know, it's not going to be a cheap. The traditions of, are remembered from what the elders have told you and your family members have told you that you're going to remember that. but. We have to think about we're in a new generation, a new age. Things are going to change. 
change is on her mind. Her son, Lonnie, brings his own climbing skills to his ancestor's home. At the bottom, like you really want to look at it and, and be mostly inspired by the way it looks. And you just want to be on there because it, it looks really interesting and cool. Okay, so you want to make sure that, especially when you get up a little bit higher, that when it's time to commit, that you're really 100% sure that you're going to commit. Normally, when you're on it, on the climb, it's way different than when you look at it. Climbing without harnesses or rope, Lonnie feels a part of the earth. When you get way up, like super high, like you definitely start feeling that vibe of like, whoa. <laughs> You know, you might get a little bit jittery because you know in the back of your mind, like if you slip, you could be seriously hurt or even be done completely. And you might think like, oh, I'll probably feel fine there. And then you get up there and it's like kind of scary or something, you know, so you got to be able to stay calm and, and really try to read it, you know, like, like a book or whatever, you know, just try to understand it truly. I know that every step that I take, it's just for them, you know, it's for the ancestors. They used to walk around this whole land, and now, they're, now here you are in the future doing it too. But you're doing it in a different form in this way, you know, climbing up the walls. Well, I know that when I make it to the top, that all the native people out there make it to the top. They come with me, and I'm a reflection upon them. You'll grab a hold and You'll just really feel the rock like in your fingers. And then you know, you're like, yep. And you pull up and you'll reach up like totally blind. And you'll grab the next hold and you'll feel it. it turns into like this little dance kind of in a way to where it's more like, I don't know, like, like ballet or something, you know, where it's really smooth and controlled and Everything in your own world with your mind and your thoughts and your feeling, everything comes into a good place. And then it's just awesome. You know, it's like listening to music. Oh, I'm really, really happy with Lonnie, and he, you know, he's done a lot of that on his own. You know, he's grown up in the family, and we've always done, you know, traditions and, you know, just being family. And uh, he's really taken off on his own to find his, uh, his things that he, his visions and things he wants for himself. I got that native blood pumping in me. All right, we're gonna do some good stuff. We're gonna do some good work. You got the same capability as anybody to do anything. And especially when it comes down to being connected to the land and being from there for thousands of years, that's like royalty status. That's something that his, his ancestors possessed, but they may have done it in a different way. But he's, he's, he's doing it in his way, which I think they would be very proud of because I, I, do, I do believe that they always honored traditional, I mean, individual achievement. But I think once you start to recognize yourself and understand your, your cultural identity, you become stronger. And that, that strength then um, allows you to not only understand your, your own culture, but it gives you a sense of empowerment. We do operate as a, as a sovereign nation. We do have special relationships with the federal government. We do deal with the state of California differently. Um, they know that they have limitations. We're, we're sovereign in that we're treated, or we should be treated as states. So, so there are laws in place to say that, that tribes, when they show the authority, they, they can be treated as states. And with that, we can create our own laws. Uh, now, federal law will always be the foundation. And then on top of that, you can have tribal law. Through law, 
The tribes are becoming guardians of the land, guardians of the people. Without our presence, who would be a voice for the, for the plants? Who would be a, a voice for, for the animals? And then, then again, who would be the, a voice for the people too? Because it's all of us connected together that, that makes us who we are as a people and, and our belief system. <laughs> It may be controlled by someone else in that kind of, a, I guess, a broad sense of sovereignty Spiritually, we still control, we still feel that it is, it is ours. Indian country embraces such well-known parks as Death Valley. Even here, the tribes are taking on more responsibilities for the land and its resources. This is our land. We have the right to pick um, the fruit that comes from the land. We have the right to, um, to dig a hole, to build a fire. You know, we, that's what that means, and we will do our prayers, and we will give offerings for those, for those things. But, but when, when the Indian says, this is our land, that's what it means. This is our land, our land to do with what we want, and keep those traditions and customs alive. We prefer not to call it Death Valley. We prefer to call it Timbisha. That's the name of our land. That's the name of our people. That's our name. This is our land. Park Service took it over. The Indians were here first before Park Service came in. It was a monument at first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we were here before the monument. So the land is ours. official tribal mentor for the land. Working for the tribe, she ensures that the use of resources is consistent with tribal pacts. The new Indian pride and rebirth meant that Death Valley tribes had to reassert their responsibility with regard to tribal lands. When we was trying to, to get to some of our lands back for our use, because we were restricted, you know, told us that this land is not yours, I want to talk to the government, I says, the United States government. I says, because we are a nation of people, I says, and that's who, I, that's who we want to talk with. We've always lived here um, in Death Valley since time immemorial. Um, you know, all our, all our people have come from here. And um, we, we became fairly rec recognized in 1983, but we weren't given a land base because of where we're, where we're at here in, in the Death Valley National Park. It took quite a while, quite a few meetings, but it just so happened that uh, uh, we were very lucky. We had people in D.C. that was sympathetic. We finally worked out an agreement and it was signed by President Clinton on November 1st, 2000, giving us over 7,000 acres of California and Nevada lands patchwork uh, with 314 right here in the heart of the park. The survival of nature and plants such as mesquite and its beans were important to the tribes. Parts of thousands of plants are recognized by tribes for special uses. And these would be the, the grinder. See, then you, would, you could put the beans in there and just mash it. And then there's this one too, so you can see. A 
In Owens Valley, Paiute families still remember the violent removal of their people from their beloved homes. In 1863, my great-great-grandfather, Ponatubachi, he was a chief of this band of Indians here. He was forced marched down to Fort Tejon with the rest of the Indians. They said anywhere from 900 to 1,000 Indians to get rid of them out of the valley. A lot of them died along the way and they were left there. So eventually, people would sneak off on the forced march and come back up here. Returning to their ancestral home of forest and streams, the Paiute kept alive their ancient traditions. My dad, Raymond Stone Sr., he made me this pipe and he says for me to start learning the sweat way and someday carry on where, when he left off. But at the time I told him I wasn't worthy of it because I was still young and dumb. He said the only thing you got to do is start coming to the sweat lodge and join in and learn the songs like I have. My older brother Shorty did and uh, he passed away so um, I'm doing it today. and doing the best I can. To put this together, this pipe and the stem, this is the bowl made out of pipe stone and this is the stem. I line it up because I got a little X right here that goes to the top. I push it together and twist it where it's lined straight up and down. Then you put your tobacco in here and then you, you touch Mother Earth, which you mean like the center. Then you go north you rotate it to the east, south, and west. And then you touch it to the Mother Earth again. You light it up because there's tobacco in there. And you smoke it. When you're smoking it, you pray. You pray and the smoke takes, your, your, takes it up to the sky, to the crater, to answer your prayers. <laughs> Tom Stone's son Raymond eventually became the spiritual leader of the family and was known far and wide as a sacred healer. Raymond, granddaddy of Stacy, Stacy Stone, still cherishes her memories of him. I just can't sum it up what he means to me because he was always a big part, a fraction of my world in every sense. You know, the best part of my grandpa, I can remember just sitting out on his lawn and just, he, he was over there just sitting or whatever and we didn't need conversation or words and you'd walk away and say, felt pretty good to do that. It, it, that it was like no spoken words and just to know that he was there and it feels good to be able to, you know, go to some of the places he, you know, he was walking. Raymond Stone was one of the elders who asserted the necessity of Indian guardianship of the land and its resources, especially the water. I walk around, sit down, and feel the nature that's there. I feel it. And I give myself out to them, my spiritual being. And it feels good. The valley was covered with water. 
This country was a beautiful country at one time. The city bought all these land. And they take the water down to LA. By the early 20th century, Los Angeles, some 300 miles away, put in aqueducts and dams to remove water from the once verdant Owens Valley. Owens Valley water is transported to reservoirs in LA and became the engine which fueled the growth of the nation's largest city. As LA became dependent and made more aqueducts, springs dried up and rivers disappeared. Us Indian, we don't feel it's right. So now it's just drive. This is where my people used to live many, many years before the white people ever come to this country, right through here. And my old grandmother talked to the great spirit and thank him for having good and clean water to drink. Material things meant nothing to him. If he had it, he was giving it to you. He'd do it without question or a thank you in return. There's probably a lot of stories out there about his generosity and, you know, he made you feel good when you talked to him and you were important and it was, he was a really an amazing man. It is part of me, my people, and all of us. And I hope, as I look upon this, country of mine, that some good will come of it. I think Dad would be thinking about people that own this land, maybe even the DWP, that hopefully they wouldn't bring in factories and stuff like that, that all people could enjoy this country. It was for all people of different nationalities to enjoy like they do today coming up here to ski and fish and hunt. He wasn't too much of a, a militant Indian. He wanted, you know, the country pretty much to stay the same as we see it today. It's drier as time goes on, the water is more important. Raymond, an early guardian of Indian country. Today, his far-sightedness is becoming a reality. Owens Valley water, in fact, has become an even more urgent issue for the tribes. The tribes still have water rights under the federal government they, that they have not relinquished. And that is a battle with the city of Los Angeles in terms of water. And so we are, at the present time, still negotiating with the city of Los Angeles and the federal government for those water rights. The city of Los Angeles has seen that they, um, that they really desire water to be able to, to not only help the population that they have uh, continue to exist, but also so they can continue to grow. And so, so they've taken the water from the Owens Valley and moved it down to LA. It's not a real lush area, and we need this whole valley to be who we are. 
water is life. Water is important to everything we do. Without water, we, we wouldn't even exist. Kathy Bancroft is a tribal representative who is familiar with the heart of the Los Angeles Owens Valley water issues. Water is the central theme, and, and it's becoming a kind of a scary theme because there's getting less and less of it. We have uh, places that used to have a lot of water, trees, animals, fish that are completely gone now, like this lake. Owens Lake, now largely dry, was a major victim of Los Angeles' need for water. My family lived here for years. This lake sort of provided all kinds of things. The food, the, there's uh, basket making materials right here. There's medicines all around it. There's, uh, that's what's important about this lake. This lake today is almost a symbol of, you know, they came, they destroyed, they took the water from this lake <clears throat> and that wasn't bad enough. Now they're coming and they're destroying the lake bed itself and destroying our cultural resources and what's left of our history. This land is steeped in history of both pioneers and native peoples. Indian artifacts such as these document an ancient heritage. It's kind of like the tools we find, the artifacts out in the, out in the lake or wherever we're at or our front yards we find artifacts and you look at it it might just look like a rock but you hold it in your hand and you play play with it for a little while it's like whoa this fits right here like that and you can tell there's wear marks and stuff that somebody used that and it fits right in your hand despite laws protecting indian artifacts the temptation to loot remains powerful in Indian country. This is our lake. This is Paziata, which is um, important to us. And, and we want to say in it, and nobody has asked us. Tribal members working with local Owens Valley residents are making headway in reclaiming the rivers and marshes they once lost to LA. The valley was known as Payahunado or Payahu, which means the place where the water continually flows. And that's the significance of this river that runs clear through our valley. And that's what makes it really important. It's the life of this valley. Uh, you see all the vegetation, the animals that live around here. Mike Prather is a local resident who has worked to reclaim the lost water. I grew up outdoors. And that is one of the core things in, that defines me. I think a river represents life. It's like veins in the earth. It's just like arteries. It carries fish. It, they, it, there's wildlife. It has water for people. You can grow things with it. That's the way I look at it. To me, it's very much alive. I've worked with um, Paiute and Shoshone people in the valley on water issues and land issues for a long time. Water is like gold, it's like liquid gold. And uh, Los Angeles, uh, like most people in California, if they have water that they're, they claim they own, um, they're gonna fight for it. And they felt they were big because they have four million people. And we have a whole county as big as Connecticut that has 18,000 people and they thought they could whip us. We have had our victories. The fate of Mono Lake would have been similar to Owens Lake 
except for the efforts of local residents to restrain the city of Los Angeles. The partial success at Mono Lake created a thriving wildlife sanctuary. This could be Owens Lake. Since I've lived in the Owens Valley, um, I've seen water return to um, this section of the, of, the, of the Owens River, the lower Owens River, 62 miles of channel that was, was virtually dry previously. We're never going to get back what was here before, but a good effort has been made by a lot of people um, to kind of bring Los Angeles to the table being responsible for some very serious uh, damage to the environment up here and to the people. The tribes can, they can tell their own story because they have tremendous stories. Uh, lack of enough land, lack of enough water when everything was set up, just lack of enough respect. We have a lot to be proud of in the valley. There's a lot more work to do and we're always going to have to watch. The new Indian Guardians are alive and well, and pushing back at efforts to destroy the environment. Ross Stone's family maintains a strong, protective love for their land. Remote lakes, hidden springs. There is more here than meets the eye. Hidden on the land are sacred hot springs, which Ross and his family center their life on. The most precious is known as Coso Hot Springs. In preparation for a visit to Coso Hot Springs, Ross and family pause first at Prayer Mountain, where they ask permission to visit the spring's guardian spirits. If this was just closed off, it, I wouldn't feel right about that happening. This land is part of a secret naval weapons testing center, and access is closely controlled by the U.S. government. Coming down here today at the Coso Hot Springs, it, it's good, it feels good, and at the same time, it's sad because we came in here with some really great people. It feels good to come down here and then to come down and be able to share with my, you know, my dad and sister, my niece, my mom, sometimes my daughter, you know. It feels good because we're coming here in a family and we don't realize we're going to take these memories 
and be able to share that some down, down the future. Today, Coso Hot Springs is a series of dangerous boiling cauldrons. It wasn't always this way. The springs have created healing waters and mud and a vibrant spiritual presence in use by the Paiute Shoshone for hundreds of years. We should have access to these lands, to these resources for culture purposes. The shoppies are red clay, the mud, and then our ancestors, my dad and other Indian people would collect this stuff and they would put it on whatever ails them, put them on their body all over. And they would pray, pray to the, the caretakers of this coastal area. And caretakers, I mean spiritual beings. Coso Hot Springs holds hidden dangers and visions. She's in that age where she's growing, she's learning, she's picking up her language, but more so she thinks being the color brown makes her Indian. So we kind of have to reiterate things and say that, Ellen, it's not because you're brown that makes you Indian, it's because of your culture of what makes you Indian. Further down there is like a mud pond down there bubbling up and everything. For a split second, there was a pillar, and it was pillar looked like from the shoulders on down a man's figure just standing there. And as soon as I seen it, it just disappeared. And that to me showed me that there were spirits here. The springs were once not so violent. The Department of Defense is developing geothermal power here, and tribes question the wisdom of the new developments. At Coso Hot Springs, you have a, a geothermal plant that is in operation, and, and the tribes believe that because of that operation, it has totally changed the, the surface manifestation of those hot springs. And, and the Department of Defense uh, owns the land. The geothermal development is part of a massive intrusion of military tech into Indian country. We're constantly getting assaulted, I would say, with projects coming onto the scene that, that impact our people. How do we know when there's impact to these hot springs? And then there's supposed to be an evaluation as, as they go through and, and monitor uh, this geothermal operation to see if, if these things are taking place. And, and really, I, I don't see where a true baseline was established where criteria was developed, and then there's, there's not a, an evaluation being done. We're all a part of this land. To be able to come down here and still be able to access it, maybe we can't utilize and get in the water anymore, maybe we can't drink the water, but you know what, the spirits are still here. From Coso Hot Springs to Mono Lake, the oldest generation of elders preserved enough traditional culture for a rebirth of tribal values and guardianship of the land. The wisdom of the elders is the basis for a new culture and emerging impetus in Indian country. I really um, looked up to her and it's almost like when I was growing up, when I was young, I always felt really a closeness to the elders. But it really wasn't teaching, it was just showing what, you know, the people, what our people did. You know, the foods that were out here on the lake and, and um, she'd tell me the stories. And la we do a lot of laughing and I would just feel, just, you know, just want to be a part of it. 
of, you know, her. Would they take the, uh, the chavi over there to the, to, to the yes. relatives over there? Well, um, she never really explained why or anything, you know. You just would just go with her. <laughs> she said, this is how you do this, you know. The elders left a legacy for wisdom and practical knowledge on traditional ways. Lucy is learning enough to fuel the rebirth of traditional ways. All the ladies used to go, they used to come to Yosemite when I was a little kid. These baskets, they'll last forever. You know, it's like pottery. Somebody make a famous potter. <laughs> throw it on the ground, it breaks. Throw a basket on the ground, it don't break. Yet, much has yet to be done. Much has yet to be done. Artifacts are still in popular demand and command high prices. I've seen a lot of baskets being sold, including my great grandma Lucy's and uh, Jesse's family and their basketry being sold for very large, large amounts of money. So if you look in the other book, that's, that's, uh, that's, if you can put this here, Lucy, Lucy Tellers? Or? Lucy Tellers? Oh, no. Look at that. Anyway, she's holding uh, on this original photograph this basket, which gives you, you know, a lot more collectability. There's some people who've had to go to auctions and buy their family's baskets back for large amounts of money. 7,075. Ownership of tribal articles remains an issue worldwide. The answer is elusive. Selling at 95, it's the last time. 9,005. 907, thank you, sir. Lucy has her own dream. I feel it would be good to if the family is still alive, like here, take your family's basket home. If a collector had baskets from those families and they have descendants, I would just, here, take this basket back. This was your grandmother's basket, you know, and there's no value, but, you know, to honor that. So that's what I feel would, would be just wonderful. It's good for your body, and uh, the old Indian used to say it's good for your blood, and your headache, and your body, it gives you energy. That's what they used to say, and then they drink this kind. They don't drink coffee very much. Yeah. Uh-huh. So she d just telling me that uh, the food and that we eat and things like that, you know, even this is given to us by the Great Spirit and Mother Earth. Language is kind of getting a little bit of revitalization because it almost completely died out. We've lost a lot of our, almost all of our native speakers. But there's a real interest. Um, uh, we have a language program. The language is a big part of it. Um, my grandpa spoke Paiute, my grandma was a Washo, and she spoke her native language. To be able to speak Paiute and come to an area like this, I think more connection to the land and mm. everything's tied together. Rebirth of culture is not simple in Indian country. Plant uses may be long lost. Only the elders knew it all.
Habana, 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 no way, money way. To her Nikosuki, I take. At the very heart of the rebirth is language and the words of the elders, a way to preserve the very means of tradition. Communication is an ongoing challenge to the tribe. Though it is hard to tolerate the inevitable losses, an Indian rebirth of culture and guardianship in Indian country shows no sign of slowing. One thing we do in the valley is come out and take care of where people were buried for thousands of years. With the drought and stuff, the vegetation's dying, so the sand tends to blow away, and then it reveals all the burials. We put sticks over them, you know, old dead brush, to try to um, catch sand and seeds. These burials are, are becoming buried better and there's actually plants growing out of them, so that's good to see. I wish the kids would learn our language, though. <laughs> We're not going to overnight have speakers. We're not going to be able to, you know, go in certain areas. We're getting somewhere. We're not there yet, but we're getting there, and we will be there. Even though one generation may come and may go, future generations will stay, because this is our, this is our place. This is our home. Why would we go anywhere else? Thank you.